أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحانك لا علمنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت الأليم الحكيم ففهمنا سليمان وكلنا تينا حكم وعلم رب شرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل الأقضة من لساني يفقه قولي لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله الأليم الأذيم سبحانك لما وحنانيك ألم لا تنسني ولا تنسني الحمد لله أفضل الحمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آله وسائر النبي المصالحين وسلم المؤفقني وحدني وسددني وجمالي بين السواب والثواب وعذني من الخط والهرمان آمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to another episode of questions and answers I know we've been away for a while uh, with the uh, Eid I pray that you had a blessed Eid and a Eid full of fun and full of food and I hope that you also took opportunity of this Eid Eid al-Adha a day in which or days in which we slaughter uh, for the sake of Allah, for his pleasure, for his contentment in his name. Uh, and at the end of the day, we get to eat the food as well. But the, the sacrifice itself is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I was fortunate enough, alhamdulillah, to uh, carry out that particular ritual, that compulsory act, as were my family members. And alhamdulillah, it was a, some tasty meat that we had over the few days. And also, because we did some uh, qurbani abroad, we were able to share much of the meat abroad with the poor people and those people who rarely get a chance to eat meat. So now that we've had the break and we're back, well, it must go on, inshallah. We plough forward with Muharram in sight, inshallah, the start of a new year. And then we start all over again. Okay, we start all over again. We go through the Islamic calendar. And then before you know it, Ramadan will be upon us. And before you know it, we'll be celebrating Eid al-Fitr. And before you know it, we will be celebrating Eid al-Adha. However, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Questions and answers. Remember, the phone number to ring is 01274 214 299. That's 01274 214 299. It's a compact uh, program today um, because, uh, unfortunately, I have a another engagement which I cannot change, I cannot modify, I cannot delay in fact. So as a result, I will need to uh, kind of uh, hop, skip and jump quickly out of the studio into my car and drive at a sensible speed within the legal requirements in order to get to another venue uh, as near as eight o'clock as I can possibly make it. So you need to get your calls in inshallah nice and early. Uh, so uh, as I always say, get them in uh, because once the questioner phones in, poses the question, there's some uh, exchange, some correspondence between the two of us, and then I attempt, inshallah ta'ala, to answer the question, bi'ithnillah. And when we do, obviously, five, ten minutes go so quickly. And before you know it, we're reaching our interval, and then, obviously, we're into second part. So please do get your calls in early. And whilst we wait for those calls to come in, we're not just going to sit here and drink coffee. Now that I've said that, I don't mind taking a sip. MashaAllah, Naeem makes a fantastic cup of coffee. Okay, so uh, it's not that we're going to just sit here and wait for the calls to come in. We have, obviously, questions that are already here on our uh, forum that we have. As I mentioned to you before, we have a forum both for ladies and for gents so that they can pose their questions to us. So let's go to some of these questions here. Has been fairly quiet. Um, so let's go. Well, this is a long one. Uh, where are we going? Du, 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 um, du, 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 um, where are we? Du, du, du. Okay, there we go. Right. Salam of Sab, I have searched the ingredient carmine and understand that it is not permissible to consume nor applied if in a lipstick. Is this because it can be accidentally eaten? Is the ruling the same for cudgel eyeliner or eyeshadow? Okay, so let's reply back to this. So, wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah, carmine, obviously, we've already mentioned it comes from uh, uh, insects that are crushed, and uh, this is something that we cannot consume. So, it is the consumption issue. Um, I don't, it won't come under nudges, they won't come under filth as such, um, but uh, because the, the acid reaction would destroy any remnants of blood in there, however there may still be some, so therefore there's an element of filth as well, 
and therefore due to those two reasons particularly the consumption issue and the possibility or high probability of filth applied to your lips and if that was the case if there was carmine in this eyeliner or eyeshadow then obviously that would be the same application um, you would have to see in terms of this particular uh, brand that you're applying how much of that uh, carmine is uh, still contains the insects usually what happens is these insects are in acid uh, and therefore there should not be much left over uh, but obviously the red color is still there the dye is still there so there's also a chance that some of the remnants of the animal or the insect remains so it's important that we look at these sorts of things you know when we're looking at um, what we're putting inside our body or what we're applying onto our body uh, to make sure that the ingredients, uh, whether they are permissible to consume or whether they are permissible to apply. Okay, let's get to the next question. My apologies, myself, I forgot to add, is methyl paraben a halal ingredient? Okay, so let's reply to this. Um, methyl paraben, uh, yes, is a halal ingredient. Um, there's nothing in there chemically which would constitute it to be impermissible. Uh, so yeah, you're gonna have a bit. Of, you have to have a bit of a chemistry degree. I'm very fortunate, alhamdulillah, that the first degree I studied for way back in the day when I was a young lad, which was many moons ago, mind you, um, was to do my uh, applied chemistry degree, and therefore knowing how uh, chemical formula, IUPAC nomenclature, and also the organic structure of something allows you to understand better then whether something is going to be permissible or impermissible. Okay, that's a long question. So, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Should a man, when he wears trousers, prefer to wear some that go to the middle of the shin, so like three-quarter trousers, or rather a bit longer, and then fold them over the ankles so that the ankles are not covered? We read on a page that is recommended to wear the garment only up to the middle of the shin, as it is closest to the sunnah. But can we really conclude from this that men should Islamically rather wear three-quarter trousers instead of longer trousers that still go over the ankles because the other is closer to the sunnah? The Prophet ﷺ also wore something like a dress and uh, no trousers like here in the West nowadays. And would it be, wouldn't it be also better for the men to show less skin, especially if it bothers the wife outdoors? Or is the other then still nevertheless better and close to Sunnah and therefore Islamically more recommended? Plus the point that when the man sits down, short trousers tend to slip up a bit. So of course not over the knees, which would be haram, but when sitting it would be a bit over half the shin. All I heard, all I have heard before was that men shouldn't cover his ankles with his upper clothes because it is sunnah and also covering the ankles with the upper garments is haram for men. Okay, so let me just answer this. I know that we have a call awaiting, so please do be patient. Let me just respond to this sister and then we will take the call. So, wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, so, sister, in terms of this question, uh, it is sunnah to apply garments so that they come up to half the shin. So a three-quarter shorts would obviously be preferable. It is not sound to wear long trousers and then roll up the trousers. That's not something which is of the sunnah and not something which is recommended. Um, if the sharia permits a man to do so, then you know the wife should have no concern or issue about it uh, because technically speaking, a man could go out into the public as long as his aura is covered, um, which is from his navel, uh, beneath his navel to his knee, uh, then he, there's no issue there. The issue only comes, obviously, if he doesn't cover that as well. I'm getting a lot of rustle in here. Um, so that will be the only issue. So um, just to reiterate that, because I don't know how much, uh, uh, how clear I was saying anything to you, is that uh, for the man, uh, three-quarter length is absolutely perfect. In fact, it's ideal, because what it does, it ensures that the ankles are most definitely not covered. To wear a longer trousers and then roll up sleeves is contrary to the sunnah. That's not what the Prophet Islam did. There's no harm in a man showing his skin at all. In fact, as I've mentioned, the aura of a man is beneath his navel, including his knees. So technically speaking, a man could go out uh, just wearing shorts. He doesn't even have to wear a top, uh, as when we go for a haram. However, obviously, common decency would say that if you're going to wander around on the streets, it's probably better not to. But if you're working on the fields, or if you're working and, uh, you know, on the roads and it's very hot, there's no harm in doing so in removing that garment. Okay, so we've answered that question. We're going to take the caller because we've got several minutes left uh, before we take the break. So, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear caller. Wa alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I have a question. Um, we've recently gone through Qurbani and um, following um, Prophet 
Abraham's um, example of um, um, the, the, the um, using the animals um, instead of his son. I just wondered how that all came about, uh, came about because Prophet Abraham was born centuries before our prophet. And I just want to know how we, we've started following that and whether it was through the, the Quran or how, what, but just a bit more background to, to how it all came about because of the, um, the, the time period between Prophet Abraham and our Prophet. Okay. Thank you very much. Jazak Mahir, sister. Very interesting question um, with regards to how did the Muslims pick up the tradition of the previous uh, Prophet, the Prophet Ibrahim Salam. So as, in fact, the sister alluded to the answer herself quite, uh, in, in her question, which is that we only know about the other Anbiya through the Qur'an. So we wouldn't know about Yusuf والسلام, unless the Qur'an told us. We would not know about uh, Isa والسلام, unless the Qur'an told us. And this is one of the arguments which the Prophet والسلام, used against the Ahli Kitab and also against the Mushrikun. Now, the Mushrikun accepted that they were not people of knowledge. They accepted that. They accepted that they just copied and pasted. They just followed their elders and did exactly what they did. Whenever it became a true matter that they needed some kind of uh, understanding, they would actually go to the people as they referred to them as the people of knowledge. And they were the people of the book, yani the Jewish people and the Christians. So they would go to them when it came a serious matter. Otherwise, they followed tradition. Something similar to what we do now is we, you know, when, in our marriages, in our births, in our, uh, you know, deaths, we just follow what our elders did because we said this is how we do things. You know, we're uh, Punjabi, we're Pakistani, we're uh, Gujarati, we're whatever. And this is how our tradition is. And we just kind of copy and paste without really understanding it. Those of us who think, no, actually, you know what? I'm not just going to do what our elders did. I'm going to actually find out what, should we, what we actually should do. So they go to the people of knowledge. So when they go to the people of knowledge, now obviously we go to the ulama, as in the re religious uh, scholars of Islam. So everything that we've gained uh, is through the Qur'an. Where there are uh, 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 further elaborations required, then it has come from the Prophet ﷺ. Now when it's come to the Prophet ﷺ, and it is something to do with ghaib, the unseen, then that has also come from Allah. So it's not as though the Prophet ﷺ just kind of guessed what Ibrahim ﷺ did. It's that he has been inspired by Allah. So there is wahi which is uh, matlu, yani is recited, revelation, which is recited because it's in the Qur'an. But there's also revelation, which is ghair matlu, not recited. And that is the inspiration that the Prophet ﷺ received from Allah through Jibreel ﷺ. So that existed. So every, so, and we, what it came also, what the Qur'an did, was rectify the incorrect understanding that the people of the book had. So the incorrect understanding that the Jewish people had with regards to Suleiman, Solomon. Also, the incorrect understanding that both the Jewish people and the Christian people had with regards to Jesus, Isa al Islam, where the Jewish people saw him as a uh, charade, saw him as a, a charlatan, and the Christians saw him as a son of God. So again, it's, the Quran came to rectify that understanding. So we see that time and time again, time and time again. This is also the story of Ibrahim al Islam because the other faiths, because we refer to them as Abrahamic faiths, also claimed Ibrahim as their forefather. So as they claimed him as their forefather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to reiterate to the people that how is Ibrahim, how is Abraham your forefather when you don't do what Abraham did, when you don't follow his way. And the only Nabi who follows his way is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So those of you who truly are the children of Abraham should follow Prophet Muhammad because he is the only one that is truly following the tradition of Ibrahim. And when we look at it, obviously we see Ibrahim al-Islam's focus, particularly within the Jewish and the Christian uh, texts, focusing more towards the West. Whereas the story that we get is the finding of, of Mecca is by Ibrahim al-Islam through his wife and his son. The establishment of the Kaaba is through Ibrahim al-Islam. The pelting of the Jamarat is through Ibrahim al-Islam. The, um, all these acts that we see that are to do with the pilgrimage. Now, the pilgrimage became compulsory when the Prophet ﷺ went to Medina. So they did not do acts of the pilgrimage in Mecca. They did acts of pilgrimage in Medina. And these were the last few years uh, of uh, uh, when it became compulsory. These were the last few years the Prophet ﷺ was alive when he then went to make pilgrimage. According to most, he performed one hajj. 
and therefore this is the Hajjatul Wida, which was a couple of years before he passed away. And this is when a hundred thousand or so companions went with him. So that's when he revisited the tradition. That's when he brought the tradition back to life. And we start to see, even though in Eid al-Adha, which had come a lot earlier, second Hijri, I think, if memory serves me well, they were already performing the Qurbani. So the rites of Hajj and the rites of Qurbani came at different times. And also it was to re-bring that. So this is, in short, as I see the break uh, coming up, uh, in short, through revelation. That's how it came to the Prophet ﷺ, and that's how the Muslims continue to do that. So if you now look on the face of the earth, who is following the Sunnah of uh, Ibrahim ﷺ? It is the Muslims. Even though the Jewish people will claim that they are the sons of Abraham and daughters of Abraham, and the Christians will claim that they are the sons and daughters of Abraham, the only, the Allah says, who follows his path? Anyway, we'll join you again shortly. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.